now we will go on to our opening presentations from the European Commission. And I'm very pleased to welcome Mr. Andrea Vittori, who will give us an overview of the current and upcoming policy framework at EU level with a focus on the biodiversity strategy. Mr. Vittori is Deputy Head of the Land Use and Management Unit in the Directorate General for Environment of the European Commission. Before that, he has been part of the team who prepared and conducted the negotiations on the seventh EU Environmental Environment Action Programme. And in the same DG, he worked also on strategic planning and policy coordination, on re resource efficiency, and on an environmental programme for small and medium-sized enterprises. Before joining the European Commission, he worked in the European Parliament and for a European NGO. He holds a degree in Business Administration and Economics from Bocconi University in Milan, and before coming to Brussels, he had experiences in New York, at the United Nations, and at the Italian Cultural Institute. So please, Mr. Vittori, uh, go ahead and share your presentation when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see my, my presentation on the screen. And um, thank you very much for, for the invitation to this uh, webinar, which is very timely and, and it's really uh, the, the type of uh, cross-cutting uh, uh, approach uh, that we need uh, for, for policymaking, uh, in particular for a complex um, uh, policy issue like, like forest and forestry. Um, indeed, as you said, uh, the main uh, um, uh, two pillars of, of the, uh, the policy framework uh, for uh, um, ecosystem services and, 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 and the payment for ecosystem services are on one side the biodiversity strategy, on the other side uh, the CAP. Uh, these are the only, not the only one, but they are certainly the main one. And this is why um, Alfonso and I will, will present uh, this this framework um i move to the second one i hope it works voila so uh the biodiversity strategy was presented in um, uh, may this year uh, together with the farm to fork strategy and a staff working document on the compliance with the cap proposal with the green deal and is one of the uh, key deliverables of the eu green deal that was uh, presented uh, by the commission um, almost uh, precisely uh, a year ago um, the uh, the idea was really to deliver on the commitments uh, that uh, the president of the commission made uh, in front of the european parliament for her mandate and it was really to uh, lead uh, globally on uh, on the ambition uh, to protect and reverse uh, biodiversity loss uh, at global level, uh, in view of the uh, COP of the Convention of Bi uh, Biodiversity, um, like it has been done uh, for climate change uh, in Paris a few years ago. Um, and and it, the Green Deal shows clearly how the two are two sides of the same uh, coin. Um, in fact, uh, we always hear um, about the, the three pillars of sustainable development, but the sustainable development goals have shown us that, in fact, uh, there, it's, it's, um, that there are some who are uh, the basis on which the others uh, are uh, built on. Um, and, uh, you know, this is even uh, more visible for uh, the farming sector and the forestry sector, because if uh, uh, the uh, climate change uh, destroys uh, crops uh, or uh, soil becomes uh, unfertile or forest burns out, it's clearly that there's no economic benefits and there's no possible um, benefits for, for society. Um, and therefore, uh, that's why the Commission presented uh, this ambitious uh, biodiversity strategy in May. Um, and, uh, and it showed precisely also uh, the economic importance of biodiversity. Um, uh, the World Economic Forum has calculated that almost half of the global GDP is linked uh, to nature. And, and that's why it's the basis of our um, uh, of our wealth uh, um, in addition to our health. 
And also, uh, as you have followed probably, uh, NATO restoration will also be uh, part of the uh, effort to recover from the COVID crisis. And this is why it has been so uh, highlighted as part of the uh, recovery. So there are four elements in the biodiversity strategy. One is the protection of nature, uh, protection of what, what is there already. Uh, restore nature and means um, improving uh, the condition where the ecosystem have been degraded. Uh, enable a transformative change, so are all the, the flanking measures that can um, help uh, to uh, revert biodiversity loss. And then, of course, uh, the global agenda. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different avenues at global level in which we will have to work with our uh, partners. Uh, on protect nature, and I'll focus only on what is more relevant uh, for the topics of today, so it's the, the forest um, ecosystems. Uh, there is a commitment to protect 30% uh, uh, of uh, the uh, area on land and sea. Uh, for the part on land, we are uh, between the, what is protected at EU level and protected at a national level already at some 26%, so there's still uh, only 4% uh, to go uh, in 10 years. Um, and it's also a commitment to protect uh, uh, strictly a third of this area. So of these 30%, 10% between land and sea will have to be uh, strictly protected. Um, and uh, this uh, should include all uh, primary and all growth forests. Uh, um, and work has started already. Uh, to uh, with member state and stakeholders to define um, all growth forests and map them in order then uh, for member state to be able to uh, protect them. Another um, element of the uh, biodiversity strategy is a new restoration plan, which has a number of uh, commitments for 2030. Um, and uh, what is uh, relevant in particular for forests, although there is a quite an accent on agroforestry, so the possibility to, uh, to improve uh, and bring back um, uh, landscape features uh, and, uh, and trees uh, on agricultural land. Um, there's also a commitment to plant uh, 3 billion additional trees uh, respecting ecological principles. Um, and uh, there is a commitment to present uh, a roadmap as part of the forest strategy that the Commission will present uh, in, the, in the first uh, months of uh, next year. Um, specific provision for forest. Well, uh, there's a clear um, highlight in the biodiversity strategy that foresters have a key role to play in ensuring sustainable forest management and restoring a sustainable biodiversity in forests. In fact, forests in the EU are uh, the, the main, um, uh, a, a, a main area in which uh, biodiversity is hosted. Um, and there is a commitment to increase uh, the quantity, the quality, and the resilience of uh, EU forest, uh, notably against fires, pests, and other uh, disturbances. Uh, the, the importance of, of uh, resilience uh, is highlighted because uh, what we see is that there are more and more uh, impact of climate change on, uh, um, on forest. Uh, we see how uh, a good health, uh, a healthy forest can provide um, ecosystem services uh, for, for biodiversity, for climate change, adaptation and uh, mitigation, but also, uh, and very important, also uh, provide materials, products and services for the bioeconomy, uh, for citizens, for well-being, for tourism uh, and, and so on. Um, there is a commitment, as I said, to present uh, in uh, early 2021 um, a new forest strategy, which will build, of course, on, uh, on the commitment made in the biodiversity strategy and in the Green Deal and in the climate policy. Um, and there is also a commitment to strengthen uh, the knowledge base uh, for forest, uh, forest uh, policy making, uh, notably with the forest information system uh, for Europe. Um, 
there's, as I said, a commitment uh, to uh, increase uh, the quantity and the quality of forests in Europe, uh, which means uh, working on afforestation, reforestation and tree planting. Um, uh, there, there will be um, a major role, of course, for this in terms of support by the CAP strategic plans, uh, which Alfonso will talk about but also uh, in cohesion policy funds for anything that is related to tree planting in urban and peri-urban areas, which is very, very important in terms of uh, air quality, well-being, health, um, and uh, adaptation to climate change. Um, and there's also a new urban greening platform um, uh, related to that and life uh, projects uh, which are limited uh, in terms of amount but still very relevant in terms of uh, policy uh, results. And then the Commission uh, committed also to develop in parallel with the new forest strategy next year uh, guidelines on biodiversity friendly afforestation and reforestation because what we need to do is ensure really um, the, the multifunctionality of forests, uh, that forests uh, uh, deliver on a number of um, different uh, policy objectives. Forest management will be very, very important. Therefore, there is a commitment that the, sh the share of forest areas covered by management plans should cover all managed uh, public forests and an increased number of private forests. This is why uh, it's really important also to provide uh, services and support uh, to foresters uh, and knowledge uh, about also uh, ecosystem services and, and biodiversity um, and, and provide uh, payment for, for ecosystem services uh, adapted to the local situation. Uh, biodiversity friendly practices such as closer to nature forestry that some, some member states have already introduced should continue and be uh, further developed. And the Commission uh, again committed to uh, develop uh, guidelines on uh, closer to nature uh, forestry practices. Um, in terms of uh, biodiversity um, uh, uh, schemes and, and uh, payment for ecosystem services, uh, the Commission tried to support this uh, since many years uh, in the CAP and in other tools and um, uh, to help us uh, develop um, a specific uh, analytical framework at EU level um, that to provide a, a harmonized uh, approach, uh, which is called Mapping and Assessment of Ecosystems and their Services, MAES, which had also specific pilot on forests and uh, which uh, helped to identify some indicators um, and, and, and try really to, to provide a harmonized approach for uh, the definition and development of, um, uh, of the payment of ecosystem services uh, schemes uh, that can help achieve these uh, objectives. The first ever EU-wide ecosystem assessment was released on uh, a few weeks ago, uh, at the end of October, and uh, you can find here the link uh, where you find more information and uh, the assessment. Uh, there's, of course, uh, Sorry, I finish uh, on this one here. Uh, for the payment of ecosystem services, of course, there's a number of, of tools that can support it, as I said before. Um, what, what we see, however, is that um, uh, often member states, uh, even if at the beginning of the planning period, they, they put money uh, and develop and uh, design measures uh, for the support of uh, forest protection and forest support, uh, um, within, uh, for instance, uh, the rural development or uh, the operational program under um, the cohesion policy, uh, they tend afterwards to uh, reduce those fundings. Um, just to give you an example, there was one member state uh, who is uh, currently proposing, we had to comment uh, last week, um, to reduce uh, funding for forests by 123 million euro. Uh, which is 40, uh, over 40% of the funding that they had programmed for forest uh, support. And uh, the Commission, of, of course, trying to resist to that, but uh, this is clearly a, a tendency that we're seeing um, from, from the side of Member State. Uh, going 
towards the end of my presentation. As I said, uh, this, uh, this is part of uh, this commitment at EU level are part of the global commitments uh, and the role that the EU uh, will have to play globally in leading uh, towards um, an ambitious agreement uh, at uh, UN level. Um, and, and of course, uh, as you are uh, well aware, the, the role of forests will be crucial both uh, to deliver on, on climate change, uh, mitigation and adaptation, and on biodiversity. And there are a lot of uh, discussions uh, at global level, sometimes very heated, um, on, on, on the protection of uh, forests uh, at international level. Voila. That's uh, that's a quick overview I I wanted to present to you today, um, and then of course I remain available uh, for the following uh, discussion and Q and A session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Bertotti, for that extremely clear and thorough overview of the uh, of the biodiversity strategy and its provisions for forests. I'm now very pleased to uh, introduce Mr. Alfonso Gutierrez Terra, who is team leader for forestry in unit D4, which is Environment, Climate Change, Forestry and Bioeconomy at the European Commission Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development. He will give us an update on the current status of the EU forest strategy and the common agricultural policy and their relevance for forest ecosystem services. So when you're ready, Mr. Gutierrez Terra, you can uh, share your screen and go ahead. Well, um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. And we can see your screen. Can you, can you see the slides as yes. well? Yes, everything's good. perfect. I will start on this fight with the technologies. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, two uh, policy tools that uh, are, as you know, currently not yet adopted. So uh, it's a bit difficult for me to give, really go into many details. Uh, on one side, we have uh, the Common Agricultural Policy, which is under discussion and decision by the co-legislators. Uh, there are um, also uh, intense and intensive discussions with the co-legislators uh, nowadays. Uh, to try to close as soon as possible the text of the of the new regulation uh, regulating the, the common agricultural policy. On the other <laughs> on the other side, we are working together with uh, with the colleagues in the environment and the Klima in the new uh, EU forest strategy. Uh, as you know, it is committed to adopt this strategy in the first months of of the next year. Uh, and uh, well, we are under also internal discussions uh, nowadays how the, the policy will, will finally be shaped. So I will not be able to present in many details uh, the, the, any of, of the final results of both policies. But at least I can start by introducing what the Commission proposed already two years ago in the year 2018. Uh, for the new common agricultural policy. Uh, it is a policy that, uh, after long reflections, was decided to focus more on the results, on, on the performance, rather than on compliance. Um, as I said, the policy was designed, the new policy was designed before the, the new policy cycle, so there was no green deal at the time, there was no um, biodiversity strategy, new biodiversity strategy, when the design took place. Uh, there, was no, there was no farm to farm strategy, 
but uh, now the proposed CAP has been subject to a screening uh, and it has been found that the proposal is largely fit for the Green Deal and for the new initiatives that are hanging on the Green Deal. So basically, uh, the conclusion is that with some additional efforts, uh, the policy that the Commission has proposed for the new CAP would be fit for the new policy cycle. Uh, the new CAP um, has identified a series of objectives, uh, general objectives and, uh, and nine specific objectives, uh, three uh, for each of the pillars of uh, sustainable development, as you know, and there is a reference to, to forestry in, the, in these uh, nine specific objectives. Uh, the reference is uh, in the social, under the social uh, pillar, though we know that uh, forests and forestry are also uh, largely important for the other pillars and we are today speaking more about the environment and climate pillar. Uh, just, uh, I'm not going to go into it, there is no time for that, but I wanted to highlight a few key elements of the of the new CAP uh, related to the to the uh, environmental and climate ambition. First one is that the new CAP uh, marks an, um, a new and increased ambition in environmental and climate objectives. And for for this for the, for, for achieving this, it has proposed a new green architecture that I will show in the next slide. Uh, the second element is that the policy is more focused on performance and results rather than on compliance, as it has been um, the case for the CAP so far. Um, the third element is that uh, it, it adopts a more decentralized, I would say, uh, approach, uh, giving more responsibility and more freedom to member states who, uh, who, who will have to design and present a, a national strategic plan for implementing the, the CAP within the countries. Uh, putting together uh, the different elements of the of the policy and showing how they would address the objectives that I have shown in the slide before. Uh, and the final element I wanted to highlight is that uh, the policy will be less prescriptive in terms of design and implementation and will allow more flexibility to the member states to better target uh, on the local and national uh, needs. Uh, this slide shows the new uh, architecture of the of the CAP as proposed by the Commission. Um, it uh, and it compares also the the green architecture with the of the new CAP that that uh, will be adopted hope, hopefully next next year with the current uh, green architecture. The main the main changes uh, are well uh, as you see in the in the top uh, right of the slide the basic structure of the CAP is kept so there are still two pillars one dealing with the direct payments to the farmers and the second pillar dealing with uh, the rural development uh, element of the of the policy um, I would say that the, the proposed new policy would allow more interaction and more um, coherence between the two pillars when implementing the objectives of the of the policy um, and if you look at the bottom left uh, graph, you see that here, well, there is, uh, there is a new element that is, I think, the more, the more visible one, which is these so-called eco-schemes that uh, are, uh, I would say, extracting or, or dedicating some, some uh, a significant part of the Pillar 1 direct payments for farmers. To dedicate them to uh, the production uh, of um, of ecological, environmental, and climate benefits. I will go a bit more in details later on. So basically, the new the new architecture would uh, reinforce uh, the conditionality, the conditions under which the, the farmers uh, get the money for the direct payments. 
and then there are uh, this is uh, combined with uh, with uh, a series of options for farmers uh, that uh, when using these eco schemes and uh, uh, and the climate and environment measures under pillar two the rural development pillar i will go uh, through the different elements of this architecture which are relevant for forests uh, first of all, um, under rural development, uh, we were used uh, until now to have a series of uh, so-called forestry measures that defined in some detail which kind of, uh, of actions could be financed by the, by the member states in their rural development programs. This has now been replaced by the so-called um, uh, forest uh, um, interventions. Uh, these interventions are less prescriptive. The definition of what uh, should be done is much, I would say, um, uh, lighter than in the past. And the most relevant uh, types of interventions that for forests are those that are presented here in this slide. And I also have identified the articles where they are, they are defined. Uh, one would be the interventions linked to environmental, climate, and other management commitments uh, under Article 65. Under Article 67, there are the area specific, uh, the payments uh, for disadvantages resulting from certain mandatory requirements. Uh, in Article 68, there is a reference to investments, uh, investments of both tangible or intangible uh, assets. Uh, and then there are other uh, articles that are also relevant for forests. Uh, here I, I have identified some of them, so whether it's explicit or a specific reference in the proposed text of the regulation uh, to forests and forestry. Uh, one is uh, the Article 69 on young farmers and rural business startup, uh, the article on cooperation, uh, on knowledge exchange and information and the specific article on the Inno uh, European Innovation Partnership. So the Member States uh, can now design uh, interventions relevant to forests, bearing in mind all this, this uh, light set of conditions that are, is presented in this slide. Eco schemes are, uh, as I said, uh, the new, I would say, highlight of the new CAP. It is linked to pillar one, so it is linked to, to, uh, to the farmers, uh, to, to uh, designing payments for farmers, for implementing a specific um, actions in favor of, of environment and climate. Uh, and here I have brought an example uh, of um, possible eco scheme related to agroforestry because it is something that it is not exactly forestry but it is uh, quite linked to it uh, and this has been published in a recent com uh, commission document of um, that I, I intended to present the examples of what an eco scheme could look like as you see uh, supporting agroforestry with a provision of a series of uh, mandatory obligations for the farmers uh, on how to design and implement it would result in the provision of a series of um, ecosystem services from carbon sequestration to resilience or others uh, and this is something that the member states could also utilize in, on top of the rural development uh, interventions in order to, to develop uh, consistent frameworks in, in the countries. Finally, in this slide, I present uh, the possible use of all the different uh, elements of, this, of the architecture of the new CAP, of the green architecture, where the combination of conditionality with eco schemes and, and rural development measures could help address specific challenges or provide a specific ecosystem services. In this case, the example is on how to improve resilience to climate change of farming systems. And you see here that together with the elements of conditionality and some possible eco schemes that could, could be developed, uh, there is also reference to some of the forest related interventions such as afforestation, reforestation, or the promotion of agroforestry. Um, this, uh, in, in our understanding, would allow the member states to design the 
cap uh, strategic plans um, full buildings of uh, of uh, sets of measures addressing specific needs in a in a manner that would allow for a comprehensive and an optimized use of the CAP to address the specific needs. Changing of the topic uh, and uh, very briefly, we are working uh, now in the Commission in the design of the new EU forest strategy. As you know, um, there has been a roadmap for for this uh, for the for the strategy that has been published for uh, feedback by the interested parties until last uh, Friday, if I'm right. Uh, so we hope to now be able to analyze what, what has been the feedback. Um, in this roadmap, we have identified the key areas for action or, or, uh, or uh, specific objectives or aims that we would uh, like to see included in the forest strategy. And here, I think there is a very prominent role also for the ecosystem services. In the last slide that I have, I have uh, tried to uh, identify the references to uh, the services that forests provide in the roadmap. As you see, there are a few in a document that is very short, the roadmap. Uh, when defining the context, there is a reference to promoting the many services that forests provide. Uh, in the identification of the problem, there is a reference to securing the health and resilience of forests uh, for their effective support to, to environmental, social and economic functions and services. And finally, uh, in, the, in the section dedicated to what the initiative aims to achieve and how, um, there is a reference to uh, promoting innovative, innovative forest-based services and products. Uh, there is a reference to fostering innovative financial incentives, including payments for ecosystem services and results-based schemes. And finally, there is also a reference to, to harmonizing the monitoring in order to monitor better the supply and demand of forest ecosystem services. That's all. Thank you. And I uh, hope it's been useful and, and, and that can also trigger discussions later on. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was indeed uh, very useful to understand what's coming with the, the CAP and the forest strategy, what the current state of discussions are. So thank you very much. I think that will give the participants a lot of food for thought. So we will now move on to introducing our other four panelists. I will introduce them briefly and then they will have five minutes each to make their short opening presentations. And I ask you panelists to please stick to five minutes so that we can have plenty of time for discussion. I see that we're already getting several questions. So we'd like to leave a good time for that. So our first panelist is Fanny Pom Long, who has a background in EU policies and agricultural law. She's currently a secretary general of the Confederation of European Forest Owners, which is the umbrella organization of national forest owner organizations in Europe. She joined SEPF in early 2018, and before that, she worked as a policy director in a European association representing the EU bioenergy sector. From 2009 to 2012, she worked in the European Commission in DG Energy, and before that, she was deputy director of the French Forest Cooperatives Association. Following uh, Ms. Long, we have Piotr Borkowski, who has been the executive director of the European State Forest Association, used to for, since September 2012, where he facilitates the cooperation and experience exchange among Europe's state forest management organizations. And he coordinates state forest advocacy concerning forest related policy developments at both EU and pan European levels. Before this, he worked in the Polish state forests dealing with forest management. He has also worked for the forestry department at the Ministry of Environment of Poland and as head of the Liaison Unit Warsaw of the Ministerial Conference on the protection of forests in Europe. Before joining Eustafor, he worked for the European Commission, DG Agriculture and Rural Development. He holds an MSc in Forestry from the Forestry Faculty of Warsaw Agricultural University. Our third panelist is Julia Christian, who is acting as Campaigns Coordinator at FERN, where she has been working on EU forest policy for nearly seven years. She's also worked on forest issues with NGOs in West Africa and Central America, with a particular interest in community forest management. Her background is in environmental law. And our last panelist is Thomas Kreiser, 
who studied forestry at the Mendel University in Brno, Czechia, and obtained a PhD in tree physiology at the same university. Since 1999, he has been working at the Ministry of Agriculture of the Czech Republic in the forestry section, and has been the director of the Department of Forest Policy and Economics since 2004. He has been active in the European network Integrate, which is focused on the integration of biodiversity conservation into sustainable forest management since establishment in 2017 and was its second chairman. So I will now give the floor to uh, Ms. Long for her five minutes introductory presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. I hope you can all hear me well. And uh, I will get support to share my presentation and I will really do my best to stick to five minutes so we keep room for, for the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you for the very nice introduction. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words about um, forest owners' uh, position on the provision of, ecos of forest ecosystem services. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and I think it's, it's very relevant and we have a lot of things to say because uh, we talk a lot about the provision of uh, ecosystems from forest, um, but we always have to think that such provision of ecosystems is happening thanks to the work of millions of men and women who are behind the forest. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm working for the organization who represents the private forest owners. They are 16 million in uh, Europe and they um, represent around 60% of the European forest um, uh, land. So again, thank you for the invitation. And I will now go through the three questions that we were uh, given to try to uh, throw our main ideas. And again, hope to have time to develop that during the discussion. So first question we were uh, asked is, what is the current state of play of the policy framework for the provision of forest ecosystem services on the ground? And you see on these slides um, um, a few of the ecosystem services that our forest provide. It's uh, round wood supply uh, for material, but also wood for energy. It's uh, recreational areas, purification of water, biodiversity enhancement, biotechnologies, and there are many others. So uh, it was just to illustrate what we mean with ecosystem services, which are not limited to one or two, but it's there, they are quite a lot. So if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> please, thank you, about this, the, the current policy framework. Um, there are today several EU forest related policies um, which support the provision of um, ecosystem services from the forest. I have mentioned three, um, uh, but there they are others. So we discussed about the CAP, so I will not develop here because we had a very uh, in-depth presentation from, uh, from, from Alfonso from DG Agri. Um, there is the LIFE program, which was uh, mentioned by uh, Andrea, and um, here maybe to highlight one challenge, um, it's that uh, the policy program, uh, whatever, if it's a LIFE program or a policy framework, is usually a couple of years, and this does not correspond to uh, the, the LIFE, uh, the cycle, the duration of the cycle of forest management, which is very long. So sometimes it's a bit challenging to get results and outcomes from a program, which is a couple of years, if you consider the timing uh, of forest management uh, cycle. Then we can also mention the biodiversity strategy. The current one is mentioning the um, ecosystem services and their payment. Um, as it was mentioned uh, in the presentation from DG Envy, there is um, still a lack of financial means to, to implement that. And uh, something important is that the provision of ecosystem services means a cost. It means work. Uh, we, for us to provide their, their benefits, uh, there is work behind. Today, the ecosystem service, which allows mostly to, to, to get this revenue, to provide all the services, is wood selling. But now we are getting more and more into the discussion of payment for other ecosystem services. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the second question we were asked is, what has changed in 2020 for the provision of these services? Um, I would like to mention two things. The, the trend that we have seen with the Green Deal, 2020 is the year of the Green Deal, 
um, we see a, a, t a trend that um, we go towards more a segregated versus an integrated approach. Um, uh, I can take the example of the new biodiversity strategy and the strictly protected areas or um, the guidelines for close to nature forestry, which are separate from the forest strategy. So um, we support the integrated approach and we see a tendency to, to address the, the benefits and the services. Can you go back to the, yeah, thank you. Uh, in a more segregative approach, which is a bit of uh, uh, worrying us. Um, we also see a trend that goes more into the direction of something a bit more mandatory than voluntary. Um, and we think that um, the provision of ecosystem services, the voluntary aspect is, is, is key and essential to make it, to make it work. Um, a word about the payment for ecosystem services. There have been very interesting developments at national level. We have quite a good examples to share, and I hope we can mention that during the discussion. At EU level, um, we discuss a lot, but there are not very much concrete developments yet. Next slide, please. And my last slide is um, opening a bit of what are the changes that we need towards 2021. And I would like to mention that um, it's not only 2021, it's beyond, because when we address forests, it's, uh, we're talking about decades of management. Okay. Um, and then uh, what we need is a holistic views to develop the, the policies to provide all their benefits based on sustainable forest management principles. And if there are some specific expectations on certain benefits, um, of course, the EU framework can support. Uh, and uh, what is important is that we need to evaluate the cost of these benefits, of providing these the benefits and reward the work that is necessary to provide these benefits. We also need to uh, really base this approach on voluntary basis and bottom-up approach. So not deciding from uh, EU on a mandatory basis and spread it, but more like what is needed at local level and get um, the, the willingness of those who manage the forest to, to get into these schemes. And of course, we need to make these benefits work with others and do not see them in, in silo mode. So I'm done with my five minutes. As a conclusion, I would like to reiterate that ecosystem services, they are many, they are a lot, and they're not limited to climate or biodiv, and we need to make them work all together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, great and perfectly on time. So I will now hand over to Piotr Bukowski for your opening presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so then I will not start sharing my screen. So I believe you can see it now. Yes, it just needs to go in presentation mode. Yes, so then uh, I was already presented. I do represent uh, the European state-owned uh, assets uh, in forestry. Eustafor is the association and Brussels level to represent this. Uh, very quickly, you can see everything basically on the map where our members, uh, on behalf of whom we are speaking. However, I wanted only to uh, to draw your attention to one point that Eustafor's aim is to promote sustainable and multi-purpose forest management uh, on sound economic basis. And then we believe that with this message, we can pass through also to the discussion on uh, ecosystem services from forests. Then a little bit uh, um, about what exactly we are promoting. So then we, uh, I mean, by we, I mean our members, these 20, 36 state forest management organizations, we do implement in, in the field the member states' national and subnational policies related to uh, sustainable and multi-purpose forestry. Of course, the origin of the, of the whole concept which was put into the national legislation is the Forest Europe process previously called uh, MCPFE with its principles and guidelines for SFM. Uh, then a little bit about uh, the ecosystem services. I think Fanny Pom already pointed it rightly that we refer to ecosystem services. We are not talking about biodiversity, for example. So for us, there is not equality sign between ecosystem services and biodiversity. At the same time, I wanted to say that for us, uh, all these measures supported by uh, or included, embraced by the common agricultural policy, 
whether the current or the future are also not equal to management of uh, forests in a multi-purpose and sustainable way because this is much broader. So then we see, especially in, in, in for state forestry, that the uh, forest management actually is equal to management of interest over interest. This, uh, this little picture uh, illustrates quite well how many these interests are and then how many uh, expectations, how many demands are being addressed to European uh, forests. And then, of course, a part of the mission or a mission of state forestry is to respond uh, to these demands as, 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 as well as we can. However, what is still missing on this picture, because it presents a little bit maybe too much positive uh, picture, we are also struggling, especially these years, with some um, significant impact of changing climatic conditions of, on forest ecosystems. This means that we have to focus maybe even more than in the past on issues related to forest resilience and adaptation of forests to the changing climatic conditions. A bit again about explanation, what do we mean by by forest ecosystem services from state forestry. So this actually presents the entire scope of these services we deliver or our members have been delivering over last couple of decades on the, uh, the, decades on the daily basis. So for us, this is nothing new. This is uh, already uh, like going on at the, at, the, uh, at the field level. And then these services are being de delivered to the societies, of course, uh, this is a different scale and a different, um, depending on, on what is the local um, site condition. So then we cannot uh, ensure that all the, the entire scope of services is delivered from every piece of forest. However, it's, it's also a question how we should understand this sustainability and multifunctionality. And then at least for state forestry, the best is to explain this at the landscape level. The question, of course, remains uh, following a bit the three guiding questions from, uh, we received from the organizers, uh, is whether and how the current EU framework promotes uh, this, this, this delivery of ecosystem services. Uh, I would say that the previous forest strategy, maybe to less extent the current one, uh, referred to to certain principles. So in addition to SFM, for example, in, in, in the previous one, it was a very important principle uh, included in the scope of the strategy that uh, forestry uh, is a part of the open market. For us, this is important to realize. And then I, I, I would say we have to be honest also to the public and we have to explain to the public that to be able to deliver the entire scope of, of services, we have to run forestry on a solid economic basis. Otherwise, uh, it won't be possible to, to probably to meet, especially in the future, the growing demands uh, from the societies. Uh, my last slide is actually referring to where to go. I wanted to illustrate it with the uh, pictures, uh, the children drawings. Uh, th that was a competition organized by DG Agri a couple of year, years ago. And then the question was asked to, to, to the children from primary school, to the students from primary schools, how they understand the forest. And then I believe that and forestry, and I believe that these drawings are actually reflecting this very well, which should be taken also as a message for the, by the policymakers. But then what do we need from the, from the policy um, makers, but also the future policy uh, setting related to forests? Yes, we need one framework which will address the complexity of forest management and its multifunctionality instead of fragmented approaches, but Unfortunately, we're afraid that we are at least for the moment continuing the, uh, going to, the, to these very much fragmented and scattered uh, approaches uh, or uh, addressing forests from different angles at the EU agenda. We need a robust and ambition, but ambitious, but at the same time, uh, realistic and feasible objectives in the future. Uh, instrument which we believe the best role can should be played by the new forest strategy post-2020. We need to the, the, the approach to be inclusive enough to cover the whole value chain because we cannot segregate 
environmental services, from social services uh, and from economic services. And we need to make our policy planning to, to have it feasible and implementable on a solid uh, financial basis from the presentation of Andrea and um, Alfonso. I don't want to say that I understood, but then I'm a little bit uh, concerned that too much focus is given for subsidizing forestry as a practice to manage uh, natural ecosystems. Uh, I think we are not in favor to make forestry completely dependent on, on subsidies. And I believe this should be uh, clearly taken into account in the far, uh, further debate on how to create the proper framework for the delivery of the entire scope of ecosystem services from forest to the society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was, again, a very uh, concise and thorough uh, opening statement. So we will now uh, move on to Julia Christian. So when you're ready, you can uh, share your screen. Great, thank you. I will just share that. Yes. Sorry, just a second. Okay, great. You can see my, my whole, my presentation is a full screen, right? Yep, it's great. Okay, great. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Julia Christian. I am the campaigns coordinator at the NGO FERN. Uh, we are an NGO working on EU forest policy since exactly 25 years, actually this year, it's our 25th anniversary. Um, and as a first input to the debate, I would like to give a quick overview of how European forests are doing now in 2020. Um, we talk a lot about what European forests can do and what they should do, but I think it's important to look at what they're actually doing. Um, as Europe charts a path towards net zero emissions by 2050, European land and forests will play an absolutely vital role. We will need to increase our carbon sink significantly in order to meet the 2050 goal, and there is potential to do so. If EU land and forests are protected and restored, they have the potential to triple the amount of CO2 that they suck from the atmosphere. Sorry, this next slide. Unfortunately, um, this trend is, is currently going at a fairly high speed in the opposite direction, actually. European forest capacity to absorb CO2, as you can see in this graph, um, has been significantly declining since 2015, and this trend is set to continue. Until 2015, EU land was able to remove around 7% of total EU emissions, but according to the latest figures from member states, Around a third of the 2005 EU carbon sink is projected to be lost by 2030. This image here is slightly outdated now as it's from the previous data set before the national energy and climate uh, plans came out, but it shows more or less the same thing, which is the European forest carbon sink reducing by about a third by the end of the decade. Um, the story on the biodiversity front is similarly depressing. As this image shows, European Commission data shows that only 14% of European forests have a good conservation status, with 85% in poor or bad shape. And if you look at the, forest, the status of forest species and habitats protected under the Habitats Directive, you see a similar deteriorating picture. Only 6% of protected forest species are improving, whilst 27% are deteriorating. European forests are in crisis. Forests are being harvested more and more intensively, and trees are being harvested from more biodiverse areas. This means that even forests in protected areas are becoming degraded. This photo is of a clear cut and some of Europe's last remaining primary forest in Romania. An area of European forests larger than Greece has now been converted to plantations, and there's further millions of hectares of planted single species, quote unquote, forests that are not officially registered as plantations, i.e. something that looks like the photo on the left. Nowadays, less than one third of Europe's forests are uneven aged. 30% have only one tree species, which are usually conifers, and a further 51% have only two to three tree species. Why is this happening? The State of Nature in the EU report, which was released just this year, showed that the top three activities causing biodiversity decline in European forests are forestry activities, removing deadwood, clear cutting, and logging old trees. Basically, as timber demand has increased, we are taking more biomass out of the forest, destroying habitat and reducing the health and resilience of forest ecosystems. 
What is driving increased harvesting? Scientific research still needs to be done to establish the precise division of causes of this trend, and there will be several. But one thing that's changed a lot over the past decade or so is that we are burning a lot more trees for energy, as you can see in this graph. And ironically, this is all the fault of EU climate targets. The EU's renewable energy policy counts biomass as a renewable energy and therefore has driven member states to invest large sums of money since 2001 in incentivizing biomass use. And this has played a significant role in transforming the European forest landscape in the ways I've just described. This is an interesting image from Estonia, which shows how logging volumes have more than tripled since 2008 in blue, and how this has gone hand in hand with the rise of woody biomass demand in orange. And one final thing I will say, which is that the figures in, in this graph here come from a great report that just came out last week by the Estonian Fund for Nature and the Latvian Orth Orthonological Society, which explains how increased biomass demand, particularly from the Netherlands, Denmark and the UK, is leading to destruction of protected old growth forests in Estonia and Latvia. So I would recommend checking out that report. And that's it from me for now. And I look forward to answering the other questions during the debate afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, very um, in-depth, even for its short time allowed. That was great. And I will now hand over to our last panelist, Thomas Kraser, for your uh, introductory presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, wait a moment. Okay, it's not working. So I'm here to speak uh, today on behalf of uh, uh, European Network uh, Integrate, uh, which is a uh, country uh, driven uh, process uh, which has been established uh, uh, some four years ago, uh, first at, at the uh, Standing Forestry Committee meeting and uh, then developed uh, by uh, several uh, countries which took over gradually its, uh, its chairmanship. Uh, here you can see, uh, let's say, uh, the mission of European Network Integrate. Uh, so it's about uh, promoting integration of nature conservation or more precisely uh, biodiversity conservation into sustainable forest management. At three levels, uh, the decision-making uh, policy level, the level of practitioners and uh, the level of uh, research and uh, academics. And here uh, you can see uh, our uh, uh, membership today. Uh, so if uh, I'm counting uh, right, uh, we are 17 now as a, as a member countries and we have also three observers and we are not restricted uh, just to EU, but uh, we include also uh, Switzerland, uh, which is uh, uh, nowadays uh, uh, the chairing uh, country of the, of the network. Uh, here just to show you that uh, uh, we are uh, supported uh, by uh, scientific uh, knowledge and uh, the basis is created by, by the network of, uh, of uh, the demonstration sites which are called uh, Martelscopes. Uh, now we have uh, 115 demonstration sites in uh, 16 countries. And uh, those sites uh, are uh, focused on, uh, let's say, reconciling uh, economic and environmental uh, interests. That means reconciling uh, bioeconomy and uh, biodiversity. At uh, uh, every plot, uh, we measure uh, every tree, assign some, some economic value, but also environmental value uh, to them. And uh, we can do some projections, some, some modeling. Uh, we can, for example, check uh, how thinning uh, operations can uh, can be later on translated into increase or decrease in economic and environmental values on those uh, uh, martelloscopes and that's a really good basis for for training and education to to forest managers but but also to nature protection uh, community so uh, mostly our discussion from the beginning was about uh, how to promote integration of uh, biodiversity uh, biodiversity conservation in sustainable forest management and uh, we are discussing uh, let's say advantages 
approaches uh, of integration approaches um, um, when compared uh, to uh, for example se segregation it's uh, uh, about uh, land sharing instead of uh, land sparing and it's about uh, balancing of uh, provision of uh, forest ecosystem services as i said said mostly uh, uh, bioeconomy and uh, biodiversity so here you can see some advantages of this uh, approach and uh, the questions uh, which has been discussed over uh, last years uh, were, for example, what drives uh, the integration of nature conservation in, into forest management, uh, uh, what uh, integration approaches uh, to nature, uh, what are the integration approaches uh, to nature conser conservation versus uh, segregation approaches, what, what are the uh, advantages and disadvantages, how those approach approaches uh, can be combined, because uh, neither uh, of them can solve the issue of nature uh, uh, of nature conservation separately, and uh, uh, we we also deal with compatibility and uh, suitability of climate change adaptation and uh, integrated uh, forest management uh, measures in in Europe. And if you want to know more, uh, just uh, click uh, on the link uh, below, and uh, that's that's the latest uh, policy brief uh, of of the informal project. Uh, that's the project of uh, European Forest Institute, which supports uh, European Network Integrate. And. Uh, uh, gradually, uh, we come to, uh, let's say, a more uh, comprehensive approach, which which, uh, which is called integrated forest management. It's not, um, uh, let's say, competition with sustainable forest management. Uh, the definition of integrated uh, forest management uh, is that uh, it's combined objective forestry to satisfy multiple so societal demands in the same limited uh, spatial context. Um, and uh, it, it has, of course, some some enablers. It, it has uh, mm, uh, some some needs and so on. So you can read on uh, read uh, later on uh, more about that. Uh, there is no no uh, no time for it uh, just now. So uh, about our expectations uh, for uh, the upcoming uh, years. Uh, here you can uh, see some conclusions for the latest um, uh, webinar of, of the of the network and uh, I uh, just uh, borrowed some chairs conclusions uh, which has been drafted at this at this meeting uh, again the, the complete list you can you can um, uh, for complete list, uh, list uh, you can um, uh, consult the link uh, which is below but uh, I just want to stress uh, that uh, we believe uh, that uh, uh, integrated forest management and integration uh, uh, approaches can contribute uh, to enhancing uh, economy, biodiversity and social uh, demands uh, uh, together. Uh, that uh, integrated forest management can uh, be a tool to respond to the accelerating uh, impact, uh, impacts of climate, uh, climate change. Um, what I would like to stress that uh, uh, there is big diversity of forest management across uh, across Europe. Uh, that's uh, one lesson learned from European Network Integrate. So uh, there is uh, no uh, simple solution uh, to all problems in all uh, corners of uh, European uh, forests. So uh, we would like to stress uh, that uh, we need to take pragmatic but also regionally rooted um, uh, uh, approaches. And uh, uh, I would like also to stress that uh, we always uh, advocate uh, for active forest uh, management. Uh, that means uh, not uh, resigning uh, on economic functions of, of forests, uh, because by, by, by just uh, simple measures like protecting uh, habitat trees, uh, you can uh, you can do do a lot of things also in in uh, uh, ordinary managed uh, forests. And uh, it's uh, very important to, to avoid uh, a leakage uh, effect. That means to, uh, let, let's say, export uh, our problems to, uh, to third countries. Uh, concerning uh, the new EU policy uh, framework uh, post-2020, 
it has been a lot uh, said said uh, said lot uh, a lot uh, in in the presentations um, uh, our colleagues from European Commission. I would like just uh, just mention that uh, we have European Green Deal. We have uh, the new uh, EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, unfortunately, a new EU forest strategy has some some delay. So it's quite unfortunate that uh, it follows after the EU biodiversity strategy because uh, it would be good to have it uh, uh, in the at the same time uh, and uh, for both of them to be uh, compatible. Uh, what is positive? Uh, that's uh, unprecedented attention to, to forests and their management uh, within the new tools. Uh, we see some uh, new targets, uh, such as uh, uh, target of pro to, to, to protect 30% uh, uh, percent, uh, percent, uh, of EU land, but also to strictly protect a third of these uh, areas, that means 10%. 10, 10 and um, uh, here I can see some, some uh, further tendency to, to the segregation approach, uh, uh, which is in opposite uh, to, to the goals of uh, European network integrate. Um, uh, there, is, there are some questions uh, like what does the strict uh, protection uh, mean? Uh, and uh, we would certainly advocate uh, against uh, against uh, abandoning uh, then then uh, that that land uh, to its uh, self uh, development to set it aside uh, what is positive of course it's work on the close to nature uh, forestry uh, there are also there is also work on the definition of uh, old growth forest for example um, but uh, here uh, I would like to stress that uh, close to nature forestry is not uh, the only uh, way how to manage forests and uh, there are also other uh, sustainable uh, practices. Uh, apart from uh, what has been uh, mentioned by my colleagues from uh, the European Commission, I would like also mention other developments, uh, for example, the new taxonomy regulation and uh, the delegated act uh, which is linked to it and the new concept of improved forest management, which uh, makes me personally a bit uh, nervous because it's a new concept and uh, I can um, uh, maybe see too much red tape uh, behind, behind this. Uh, uh, for example, introduction uh, of work with uh, forest management plans, uh, uh, obligation linked to it, uh, but uh, it costs, uh, it brings some, some costs, uh, of course and uh, some administrative burden. So um, what I, I miss uh, uh, at the moment uh, a bit uh, that's um, creating real uh, enabling environment for provision and payments for ecosystem services is something I would like to see um, uh, to be more emphasized uh, in, in the new developments. And uh, I do believe that uh, all those things I mentioned uh, brings more op opportunities or, uh, than threats to integrated forest management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. And now that we've heard from all our panelists, I will hand over to you, Georg Winkel, who is head of the Bonn office and the governance program of the European Forest Institute, who will moderate the panel discussion for the remainder of our time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Um, thank you very much, dear speakers and panelists. It has been absolutely great that you took the time in this extremely busy period uh, before Christmas to give us so many insights on the current and future development of EU forest policies. Um, before I start, and I don't think we will have a real panel discussion, it's more a question and answer session. Originally, we thought even about Christmas and New Year's wishes by the participants to all of you, um, but I think it will rather go away that they will formulate questions, participants will formulate questions or comments, and then we ask you to reflect on that. Um, before we do so, I would like to really remind again the participants to use the question and answers menu to put your questions and comments as short as possible and give your name and also whom you address. And then we will also promote some of you and make you live to put your question in original. Um, I will start with um, a question to Andrea and Alfonso, where I'm specifically grateful that they took the time in this busy year to present uh, the perspectives of the Commission, DG Environment, DG Acri. Um, but before I do so, I want to give a warning to Sarah um, from Boku, Enrico, Vidale and Laura. We will try to promote you to give you a live chance to formulate your statement question 
after this initial question I put to the commission representatives. So you are warned, um, you can nicely dress or whatever you need to do to become live afterwards. Well, uh, Andrea Alfonso, um, I would like to start a bit um, from where um, Thomas has actually ended up, integrated forest management. If you look at the forest land in Europe, there's actually a huge category that is not strictly protected, but is also not an intense plantation. It's actually the absolute majority of Europe's forest. I guess I'm saying like, depending on how you count it, 80, 90%. And there are approaches like multifunctional forestry, um, sustainable forest management, closer to nature forestry, and so on, are used to describe management of this land. And my question to the both of you would actually be, what is the importance that you see from a biodiversity perspective um, in Andrea's case, um, but also from for both of you from a multiple forest ecosystem services perspective for that forest land, what importance does it have? What strategic importance in your thinking? And also if you would outline one or two key tools that you think the commission should apply in the future to support this in-between management, multifunctional, closer to nature, integrated forest management, what, be, what would be these one or two key tools? I wonder, Andrea, if you want to start, as you had the longest time to relax <laughs> between your presentation. So what is the importance of this in-between forest land? Um, and what is your key tool to, to work on that? I think, uh, as you said, uh, it will be absolutely crucial, uh, that, that part there. Um, uh, you know, where the, with taking care of uh, protecting only the forests that are under Natura 2000 or protected under natural ecosystems and then um, uh, forgetting about uh, the biodiversity and climate and other ecosystem services. We saw in the slide of uh, Piotr from Yusuf for how many multiple ecosystem services a forest provide, including uh, for, uh, for the, the, the communities that live around them. Um, so uh, the, the, the aim of uh, the forest strategy and uh, the, for the forest elements of the biodiversity strategy was precisely um, to increase the health and the resilience. And that's why we talk about quality of forest, because uh, it, what, what, what we need to ensure is the health of the forest. We need to have a healthy and resilient forest vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change um, and therefore depending on on the characteristic of the forest on the location of the forest on the main use of the forest uh, because uh, you know uh, the, the, there were also some questions related to the protection you can't do anything and that uh, it's not true if, if a forest is protected um, for instance in Natura 2000 you can have a viable um, uh, forestry activity in that um, and often uh, CPF presented very nice uh, best practices and cases in where you can have at the same time um, a protected forest under Natura 2000 as long as these activities are in line and, and compliant with the uh, protection management plans of, of the site, uh, then you can have uh, viable economic activities. Um, and the same goes for um, uh, managed forest uh, for uh, wood production. Uh, you can also uh, have uh, active uh, management uh, to protect biodiversity, increase uh, forest uh, uh, species, uh, variety, uh, um, and, and ensure that uh, over the, 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 the dozens of years that the forests uh, remain there uh, to limit the, the interventions uh, in, in, in areas or in periods where uh, it would be more detrimental for biodiversity. So there are very various ways to do it. And we need a, a, a coherent approach, uh, but it's targeted, of course, to the different type of forest. Uh, a forest uh, in, uh, in Cyprus is not the same thing of a forest in Lapland. So we need common principle, common um, approaches, but we need uh, adapted to the local uh, situation. And this is why I think Alfonso has explained very, very well 
um, that's the way, uh, that's why the, the CAP has this new approach uh, that while we have a policy framework, which is defined by the EU policy, the biodiversity strategy, the, the farm to fork, uh, the climate uh, uh, policy, and the, the, the more uh, general objectives of the um, CAP, but then uh, the projects uh, and the measures need to be defined at national uh, or regional level. You're oh. muted, yeah. Oh, sorry, um, my colleagues were doing this, I believe. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Andrea. Um, I would like to play now the ball to Alfonso um, to ask a bit the same question. So this in between land, it's a bit an unfortunate term now, but basically what is, um, what do you think will needs to be done there to support exactly what Andrea has now outlined, these multiple forest ecosystem service, these very different situations across Europe in which forest management takes place. So what do you think is the, if you would name one or two key tools from the European perspective, what would it be? Yeah, thank you, Jörg. Uh, as well, um, I would like to highlight that uh, for us, uh, these, uh, these uh, areas uh, outside the protected uh, forest land are as important as, as uh, they can be for the, for the protected areas. Just to remind that, uh, well, in, in Natura 2000, there is a significant uh, share of, of, of it that is forest. It is about 50% of the, of the Natura 2000 uh, in land. Uh, but outside it, uh, we have to think that we are talking about um, surface area covered by forest and other wooded land that is about uh, 43, 44%, 44% of the full EU uh, area. This means that uh, in order to ensure sustainable management, sustainable development, you have to take as much care of these forests that are outside protected areas than of those that are within. Uh, Anyway, the Natura 2000 network and the Habitat Directive is supportive to, to as Andrea, I think, uh, underlined, supportive to, to management with multifunctional purposes, uh, with an eye, of, of course, on, on uh, protecting and restoring the habitats and species that are in the annexes of the directives. But uh, there is nowhere in the directive where it is said that um, that uh, and these forests have to be left untouched. And concerning the rest of the forests, uh, I think that the CAP has been supporting them for many years already uh, through, the, through the rural development pillar of the policy. In the past, this was carried out through a series of more uh, specified and, and clear um, conditions that were expressed in these uh, forestry measures. Um, in the current proposal for the CAP, there is not, as I said in my presentation, uh, um, so mandatory approach in terms of, of the forestry measures, despite the types of forestry measures that could be supported are mentioned in the, in the proposed uh, regulation as well. And basically, I think that there, there are lots of options for supporting um, multifunctional and sustainable forest management, also in support of, of uh, biodiversity and climate, but, uh, but taking this into a, a more uh, an integrative approach where also the functions of forests uh, for, for provision in services, including wood and other, and other, and other goods uh, are also included. So I, I think I would like to highlight that, uh, um, of course, the CAP has been, has been supporting payments for, uh, for environmental and, and climate benefits, but it has been supporting as well with a huge amount of money, prevention, um, prevention measures, measures to prevent and to ensure that forests are kept in good situation, restoration of forests. And uh, one, one thing that is, um, I think, very important is to support uh, further the, the prevention and restoration of forests in, uh, in a scenario where climate change is causing huge damages to forests all around, all across Europe. Um, 
and also uh, there are other uh, po po uh, options for for supporting for within the CAP that uh, go I think far beyond. Now we have put the emphasis a lot on on afforestation, but what we are always saying is that irrespective of the amount of hectares that you will afforest, if you don't take care of the 180 million hectares of forest that are in the EU uh, or already existing and in in good shape. Uh, whatever effort you may may make for for planting trees would be useless if you don't uh, use if you don't uh, take enough care of these forests, counting on the forest owners and managers, of course. Finally, I think that uh, going to the topic that has brought us together here um, on payments for ecosystem services, I think it's uh, I, I would like to to reflect. Uh, on, on the fact that it is true, as uh, Fanny Baum and, and other colleagues said, that there are many services, there are provisioning services, uh, regulating, cultural, etc. Uh, but I think the, the discussion should go on what, what are the services uh, that are demanding uh, or need that we dedicate a specific supporting tools and, 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 and for, for which we have to develop um, as, um, schemes for, for giving public support or private support to them and why. And I think this is the, the reflection we have to, to, to continue discussing today. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Alfonso. Um, and it's visible that you don't have an easy job right now working on the strategy and thinking about which of the services probably to prioritize. I would like to come back soon on this uh, question of payment for environmental or ecosystem services and we'll hand over then to Fanny and to Piotr and to Julia to comment on that. But before I do so, I would like to promote three speakers and ask them to formulate a short question. We start with Sara from Boko. Are you there, Sara? Um, yeah, hello, I'm here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for you, the time uh, you... Wait, okay. Sarah, we can hear you. All is fine. Yeah. Question. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, I'm Sarah from Boku, uh, from Vienna, Austria. And I would like to formulate a question. First, I would like to thank you all for your time and to dedicate for the, especially uh, in these hard times in COVID also. Uh, yeah. Um, my question is for all. Of, of the panelists, but especially for the, our DG, so the DGs from the, from the European Commission, Alfonso Gutierrez and Andrea Vettori. Uh, so I would like to know if being inside this framework, this EU Green Deal, you are also considering the including not just the territory of European Union uh, as forest ecosystems, but also um, from out of the borders, considering that many products and services are imported to European Union. So if this, if you have considered if this European Green Deal is also a part of the European consumers, the products that they, they consume. So um, I, I think many times this is forgetting, forgotten and is sometimes uh, just focusing, protecting the forest and services and not just this, but in economy and social responsibility also, but just in Europe and uh, however all products that people is um, consuming in Europe are having also damage in other countries, especially in the global south. Uh, I would like to know if you, if your policies are also including this to ensure that the products are also Thank uh, you. under the values. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I suggest we take two more questions that give our panelists a bit more time to prepare short responses. Please um, be short, Enrico, quick and short question. Very quick and very short question. I heard uh, about taxation about these environmental services because at the end of the day, we have to certain things to die and to pay taxes. Whatever you put uh, in a bank account, uh, whatever you put in a business plan, it should be, uh, and it is a revenue, it should be taxated. So far, the two applications I had in my forest uh, 
uh, cost more me on taxation rather than uh, other expenses. It means uh, if I have 100 euros revenue, out of this 100 euros, I have to pay rather something like 64% uh, taxes because environmental services is a normal activity. It's not on the primary activity, is not uh, on special regime taxation activity. So they trade like any LTD company. So it means that it is not worth to produce any kind of environmental services inside the actual scheme. No one of you talk about taxation. No one. In the few cases we have, the failure were due mainly by two things. Added value taxes, uh, added value, uh, value taxes, and income taxes. The combination of these two worth 64% of the profit, not profit, actually revenue. Then you add cost and you add everything. It means you produce something at a cost and not a, on a profit. That's it. Okay, thank you, Enrico, for highlighting the importance of taxation. Um, Laura, are you there to put a short question? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Okay, good. Hello. Uh, yeah, so just a short question, um, quite straightforward. So listening to all of you, there seems to be overall agreement and in favoring integrative approaches for forest management. Um, however, I, I heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I heard Miss Fanny Pomelang. Um, she said that um, in the last year, there has been a tendency for favoring segregative approaches or that they have observed segregative approaches increasing. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that. Why do you think that is happening? Why is that discrepancy between what seems to be favor here but what is actually happening? Um, and where has this been observed? Is it private forest owners? Is it state, is it, um, state forest? Or is this more a pol at policy level? So yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. So I would suggest we start with this looking beyond Europe perspective. Whom of the panelists want to quickly comment? How do we need to look at the global forest? And I see Andrea showing his hands. I would suggest just use your show hands, um, then Julia and then Fanny, and please be short and precise. Otherwise we spend already the time to answer to this first question that was the rest of the webinar. Andrea, then I had Fanny and Julia, was it correct? Yes. Yes, very quickly, just to, uh, to point to, to Sarah that the Commission adopted, uh, and by the way, you know, I see often talking about DG Agri, DG Environment, these are only internal department, uh, the organization of the Commission, you know, the new Commission can decide to call uh, DG Sustainable Development, put them together and so on. There's only one body, which is the Commission. There's one policy, which is the policy of the Commission. So it's not a, a policy of one DG or the other one. So the Commission adopted a new uh, communication on stepping up uh, action at European level to protect and restore the world forest, uh, which had as a, one of the five priorities was reduce the footprint of EU consumption on land and encourage the, encourage the consumption of products from deforestation-free supply chains in the EU. And uh, in 2021, uh, the Commission will present a follow-up uh, to this communication um, and a public consultation is still open. So I would invite uh, Sarah and all of you interested in the topic to participate in this open consultation. It's open until the 10th, so we we'll still have uh, only three days, um, which is on deforestation and forest degradation, reducing the impact of, EU pro of product placed on the EU market. So it's a really um, uh, uh, an action that the Commission has uh, in its priorities for next year um, and will deliver on this uh, commitment, uh, precisely because uh, it's uh, absolutely crucial that uh, we are consistent uh, with our approach. Uh, uh, on one side, we should not ask uh, to protect uh, the um, uh, primary forest uh, in uh, tropical areas or in other countries if we are unable to protect uh, those uh, 
forest in our, in our territory. At the same time, we should not uh, uh, export uh, problem um, in, in our countries uh, through our consumption and production patterns. And so this will be added uh, and treated, uh, addressed at the same time. Thank you very much. So Sarah, you have something to do now. Uh, Fanny, next. Thank you. So I understand we, we only answer to the first question <clears throat> related yes. to the... Okay, so very, very briefly, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention the ongoing consultation on these uh, uh, policies to address the deforestation and forest degradation. <clears throat> Just to answer something very important to us on that question, is that we are, of course, very happy to discuss about what's going on in EU forest because we represent European forest owners. But the question is very relevant because um, uh, when we put in perspective these policies to address deforestation and also the policy that is developed to address biodiversity, we have to make sure that the rules that we define at EU level for EU forest will not have a kind of trade-off uh, impact, meaning that at some point we will still whether people won't like it or not, we will still need more wood to address climate change. We will need wood to substitute fossil fuels based material and energy. So we would prefer this wood to come from the EU. And uh, so we need to make sure that the rules which are set at EU level uh, can be met and do not have a trade-off uh, impact, meaning importing more wood from uh, 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 countries where we don't have much uh, control. So, of course, we will answer to this consultation on forest deforestation and forest degradation. We have a bit of concerns that in this consultation, um, there is a mix between EU forest, third countries forest, degradation, deforestation. Uh, a lot of definitions are missing. We don't really see where, where, where the policy will go, but uh, make sure that the, all the policies are, are, are coherent and go into the same direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fanny. Julia. Thank you. Um, so yes, in response to this first question, I would like to uh, just support the initiative from the commission that, that Andrea has mentioned. Um, NGOs, as well as I think over a million uh, uh, Europeans have now submitted responses to this consultation, supporting a strong regulation, uh, which ensures that uh, commodities coming into Europe are free from having caused deforestation, ecosystem degradation, and human rights uh, abuses abroad. Um, so just to express um, support for a strong regulation there. Uh, I just wanted to quickly respond to what Fanny just said as well. I very much agree that it's, it's very important to ensure that uh, measures we put in place to protect forests in Europe don't just lead to a shifting of uh, wood supply from other parts of the world, but I think it's also important uh, someone else mentioned it in their presentation as well. Uh, timber demand is not a static uh, thing. It's, it's also influenced by policy. And, and we have a number of policies in place which are actively causing increased timber demand, including uh, the use of biomass for energy. And this is something that needs to be examined. It's, if, if it's causing unsustainable deforestation, either in Europe or elsewhere, then I think we really need to ask questions as to whether or not it's really an effective climate tool. Thank you very much. Um, let's come to the second question, which was basically, uh, as I understood it, um, focusing a bit on taxes. Um, any comments from the panelists on that? I mean, well, obviously, uh -huh. Piotr, then Tomasz. Thank you very much, uh, Georg. Yes, and then uh, thank you uh, also, Enrico, for the uh, for the question. I mean. We do not collect in USTA for information on, on, on such parameters uh, from national level, like, for example, the taxation policy. Although I wanted very quickly react because, of course, in different countries, different uh, like systems are uh, applied uh, in the national legislation. In some countries, for example, management of forest is uh, uh, of state forest assets is released, for example, from the income tax. Uh, but on the other hand, there are some other taxes being paid. So, so you know, I, I believe it's not like possible to, to make a general approach on, on, on the EU level to this. Uh, sometimes they pay VAT, sometimes not. Uh, in some cases, and then I think that majority of USTAFOR members, which are state-owned uh, uh, organizations of different kind to, to manage uh, state forests, are paying, in addition to provision of all the services we are talking about today, they are paying to the state budget different dues at the end of the fiscal year. 
Sometimes this reaches even like 80% of the, of, uh, of the profit or of the, yeah, usually of the profit because they have also, of course, deduct to the cost of management. If we talk about, uh, for example, organization which employs 26,000 people, just try to imagine what is, the, what is the burden related to social security of employment of these people. So it does not necessarily to be the income tax or uh, VAT, uh, but, but there are like different ways of, 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 of collecting uh, money or income by the state budgets from forest management. In general, I would say that we in state forest management, in general, not every in, in every country, we are rather providing the benefit, also economic benefit out of the management to date. Also in some other cases, uh, and then we can see it more and more, and then maybe Tamas can confirm from Czech Republic. We can hear from our member from, from Czech Republic that they are in serious uh, economic difficulties this year because they have to ensure also, which is their legal obligation, uh, of, of the national fo of, uh, forest law to recover, to, 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 to regenerate forests which, uh, which have been degraded uh, due to either bark beetle calamity or some other uh, damaging factors. So, so then, you know, taxation is not, not, not the whole story. I would rather prefer mm. to discuss it in the overall um, like uh, scope of vitality of forest management, which, which needs to be ensured if we want to talk about effective provision of ecosystem services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piotr, and also for already passing the ball to Tomasz on this interesting question of, let's say, the financial architecture of forest management relating to ecosystem services. Tomasz. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I just uh, wanted to share a uh, quite recent experience uh, because we are now in the process of drafting the new state uh, forest policy and we are negotiating also with Ministry of Finance. And uh, there was the idea that, uh, that also some exemptions uh, in, in uh, taxes could be an elegant way how to support uh, forest management and uh, forest ecosystem services. And uh, I'm have to confirm that this is not easy, that uh, uh, the general tendency, at least in our case, is uh, to abandon any any um, uh, exemption uh, from uh, collect, uh, collecting, wh while collecting uh, taxes. Uh, and uh, in past, we were successful only in one kind of tax, that uh, that's uh, property tax. And in some cases, uh, forests are um, freed from, from that kind of tax. Uh, uh, that's, for example, uh, it, it concerns uh, so-called special purpose forests uh, or protection forests. But, uh, uh, and, and now we attempt to, to uh, let's say, to no, not, not pay it for, for any, any uh, forest, but uh, we were not successful. So uh, just, uh, just uh, uh, our story from the Czech Republic. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing some experiences there. I think um, we will come back to this in a few minutes, uh, talking about this idea of payment systems for environmental ecosystem service. Then funny, you will also have the floor. But anyhow, you have the floor now, um, because I would, because Laura specifically addressed you with your bit critical statement, if I got it right, or if I got Laura's um, statement right. Everyone seems to support this idea of integrated forest management, but then you talked about it was it a trend towards segregation? Do you want to comment on this? So where are we going? Are we still, are we integrating? Are we segregating? What is your view? And of course, the other panelists are also invited to comment on that. Fanny, please. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, on that question from Laura, um, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify my point. I indeed mentioned that there is a trend, according to us, which goes a bit um, into the direction of segregation, um, whereas we support an integrated, integrated approach. Um, and this trend, uh, what I have commented, is, is happening in, in, in the EU uh, policy landscape but also at national um, level in the policy landscape. So it's not public versus uh, private forest. It's more like a trend that we observe in policy. Um, I took the example of the biodiversity strategy um, that the, the forest strategy will build on the biodiversity strategy. This is something that we still 
do not somehow understand because biodiversity is part of sustainable forest management. Um, another example is these guidelines on close to nature forestry, which will be developed under the biodiversity strategy. Uh, this will be developed um, aside or in parallel, I don't know how to name it, of the EU forest strategy, which is supposed to be the framework to, to address forest at EU level. So why is this happening? Well, I don't have many answers. Um, well, I guess they, 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 they are, they're, they are growing expectations from our societies regarding forests. I, I showed these pictures at the beginning. Um, we as citizens expect a lot from, um, from forests, including biodiversity, including addressing climate change. Um, and uh, probably the, well, the policymakers may, may want to address some of these uh, uh, challenges, which of course we, we, we do acknowledge that biodiversity and climate are huge challenges, but they should not be seen as silo. And this is what we keep repeating. So why is this happening? Maybe we should ask the question to uh, the commission here, but uh, this is a trend that we hope that the forest strategy will, will go back to something more integrated. Thank you. Um, uh, Alfonso, I think I saw your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that the final result, whether if we go towards more segregation or integration, uh, the reply will be on what will be the final outcome. Um, I think we, we can interpret the, the um, I think uh, the biodiversity strategy is uh, demanding, of course, uh, um, wider protection of uh, strict protection of certain areas, increasing the, the strict protection to certain areas. And these can uh, be interpreted, uh, of course, as, uh, as um, um, looking towards a more segregative approach if we take the forest stance uh, in isolation one by one. If we take a wider, a wider perspective, uh, my understanding is that, uh, well, this in, increase in the strict protected areas uh, it does not specifically focus on forests alone. Uh, uh, in the biodiversity strategy, there is reference to the old growth forests. I, I would say the primary forests, mature forests, whatever this, uh, this forest area that is occupying about uh, 4%, uh, is, it is estimated to occupy about 4%. 4 but, and, and of course, in these areas, uh, if they are not protected already, which uh, I think uh, most of them are already protected under different national and European um, regulations, uh, in that case, yeah, uh, the strict protection would would tend in these high specific areas towards a more segregative approach. But I think the general approach would continue to be uh, on, on promoting sustainable management of natural resources and forests, including within protected areas. Uh, and uh, at least as far as, uh, as the uh, EU directives for, for protection of biodiversity are concerned, they have not been modified and they, uh, they still contain the same text. So, so I don't think that the, the it is necessarily uh, trends or tendency towards more segregation. This is my my interpretation. Thank you. Um, we don't have time to go further on that. It's unfortunate. Perhaps funny you connect directly afterwards to Andrea and Alfonso to discuss this issue further. Um, I have two more um, participants: Lisa Thurwein and, and Luke Bass. Could you shortly formulate um, your questions? Lisa, we start with you and then look, and then we have to come to the closing round already. Lisa? Uh, thank, you very, uh, thank you very much, uh, Georg, and thank you very much for good presentations. Uh, I work at the Natural Resources Institute, Finland, and I'm wondering uh, uh, what, what could be the options or possibilities to uh, raise the standards uh, for sustainable forest management in private forests or expand the content there. Now it looks like uh, all these environmental and social values are something extra. Uh, in state forests, uh, we are, many countries are going for multifunctional forestry and multiple benefits. 
and uh, if we look at the, the benefits the forest provides for for EU citizens, a lot of them are these environmental and social benefits. So, what are the options uh, in EU forest strategy to to have a have a really uh, more sustainable forest management goals rather than paying for everything extra for for environmental social benefits? Thank you, Lisa. Luke. Thank you, Gero. Um, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to be with you for a minute or two on the panel. Um, I thought it was really interesting debate. Um, I just wanted to say that before I ask my question, um, because it, this seems like a, an incredible starting point for much more. Um, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to sound like concluding, but it's really amazing to see the debate and the discussion. Um, with, with different opinions, like from Fern all the way up to the, to the state and the private owners of forest and then the two DGs. Um, and I, I hope we can actually intensify that. Now, and for the completeness of the picture, my question is about this uh, itchy issue of in non-intervention. Um, and which is strict protection is one thing, and that is described in the ISM categories, what it actually means. And I hope we will not reinvent the wheel and I do know that there is good discussions ongoing with the European Commission to make sure that, um, that that decades of experience and categories is not thrown away. But my question then to come to the panel is, what do we need to do? So if it's not management, we talk about sustainable forest management and that's really good. How can we reward better the non-intervention in, in some parts of forests or in forests at large, which is the reserves and, and because there we really need to find ways to account for natural capital, I think. But what, what is the opinion of, of the forest owners to, to deal with the parts that, that we should have a non-intervention and which one could argue should grow? Um, and maybe the final point with this is that I've seen documents claiming non-intervention is decreasing biodiversity and what the forest owners would, would say about that. Okay, thank you very much, Luke, for being also specific. We start with your question, which was to Fanny. Um, quickly, Fanny, what do you think about rewarding forest owners for non-intervention and the relationship to biodiversity? Please, a quick answer. And then I would like to ask the standard SFM question that Lisa put to everyone, and then we need to close. Fanny. Thank you. Uh, I think we would need more time to debate, but very briefly, um, I think the point about this non-intervention and loss of biodiversity is um, <clears throat> what we have said when the biodiversity strategy was published is uh, we're not sure that in all cases strict protection would mean equally biodiversity protection because um, in some cases forest needs to be managed and uh, if you don't manage uh, climate change risk would make them more vulnerable vulnerable, sorry, and, and less healthy. So what we say is that strict protection does not necessarily equal biodiversity enhancement. It depends on the state of the forest. Um, of course, we can discuss about the type of forest that we may need to protect, this primary forest or gross forest, although we would have preferred to agree first on the definition before setting a target for strict protection. So once we agree on the type of forest that may need to be protected, then of course we, we are in these working groups to, to discuss this, um, this definition. So we are open to that. What we have said is that forests need to be managed to be healthy and resilient. So strict protection, depending on the type of forest we're talking about, doesn't mean necessarily biodiversity protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, last question, probably also not an easy one by Lisa. Do we need to work on the sustainable forest management standards? I think, Yule, you were showing your hands since a long time. I would like to start with you. I see Andrea. Who else wants to comment on that one? Uh, Piotr. And this is three. And then we stop. So, Yulia, um, was it Andrea? Yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree very much with the concept proposed by Lisa. It's an issue that biodiversity and climate change are seen as sort of extra nice to have uh, on the side of the way that we manage forests rather than something that's central. Um, I do think payment for ecosystem services is, is a key part of, of trying to incentivize this, this type of forest management. Uh, these, these schemes do need to be mandatory rather than voluntary. I, I do, I, I find it quite problematic to think that we're still in a phase of 
you know, if we want to, or if you want to, we can do it, but otherwise we sort of leave the overall objective up, up to chance. I, I think that really ignores the severity of the situation that we're in. Um, and I, I think this relates to the debate about, are we going to a sort of segregated or integrated uh, model of forest management? I, from Fern's perspective, we would love to see a really integrated model of forest management. The problem is that the model currently proposed as the integrated model really prioritizes economic objectives over all others. And that's exactly what you see in the data. If the industry would be willing to agree to and implement a model that genuinely put biodiversity and climate change as central objectives, I think that NGOs would stop campaigning for or may campaign much less for more segregated policies that try to tackle the issue from another angle because it's been so impossible to uh, pursue those objectives within the main frame of for EU forest policy. Thank you, Julia, for um, clearly saying that basically integrated forest management is an option if it's done correctly, let's say, however, whatever that means, because that will be a long uh, debate. Andrea and then Piotr, and then let's come to closing round. Yes, very quickly. Um, I think, uh, well, I would like to challenge uh, Fanny Pom on where she uh, read in the biodiversity strategy that strict potential means no management. Uh, is nowhere written there. Uh, we always consider uh, that this, from the strict protection until the uh, intensive management, a whole range of, of uh, 50 or more shades of green um, and depending on, on the purpose. So strict protection, it means that this is the aim. You need to strictly protect. So any mm -hmm. measures, you need to have a management but it's, it's aimed to uh, restore, uh, to conserve, uh, protect biodiversity and ecosystem services. This is the main priority. And this goes on top uh, and, and uh, has priority compared to the other uh, services. So it's, it's, uh, it's a complex issue, um, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, protection means uh, no uh, activity or abandoning forest. Uh, as some have uh, mentioned in the in the chat as well. So I wanted this to, to make it very, very clear. And there are, in fact, a lot of, of examples, as I said, of Natura 2000. Uh, well, 25% of forests are in Natura 2000. So, uh, and, and many of them are, are actively managed uh, also for economic purposes. Um, and this brings me to the issue of sustainable forest management, uh, which is um, uh, a concept uh, uh, which uh, is um, requested many uh, more and more by stakeholders, economic operators to be operationalized uh, also with certification. And, and we saw the question of, uh, from uh, Matteo uh, from SFC and uh, also from Lisa in how to make it uh, visible because I think what would the challenge uh, and the forest strategy of the, of the commission, the current one, uh, said that we need to uh, ensure and prove and demonstrate a sustainable forest management. So uh, there are more and more operators who require uh, forest certification. So this this is clearly an issue that we need to uh, we need to discuss how to prove a sustainable forest management in order also to um, tackle uh, what it was uh, has been discussed uh, the the imports on non sustainably sourced uh, material from uh, forest uh, uh, somewhere else in in uh, in the world. So this is clearly uh, one issue in which we need to, to discuss. Um, and on the issue of uh, what comes first, uh, uh, biodiversity strategy from to fork, um, I, I think that the idea uh, that the commission has put forward it was a green deal is the overall framework where all the policies are described. Then there are two major global challenges, which are climate change and biodiversity. And these two proposals have been forward, put forward by the Commission. Now, the forest strategy will build on them because it will put uh, uh, build the synergies between of them, putting together also the elements of the bioeconomy strategy of 2018, and so on and so forth. And they will complement with anything else, focusing on forests. But biodiversity is not only forests. Biodiversity is much, much wider, has all the, 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 the oceans elements and, and air and, and soil and so on. So that's a little bit to, 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 to clarify that, that element. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Piotr, you have the last word on this one uh, and then closing round. Yes, thank you, Georg. Uh, yes, indeed, a very good question asked by Lisa. Uh, and then I want to refer to this, but uh, because uh, for us, 
Of course, we can discuss the potentials of moving somewhere else with the current sustainable forest management practice in terms of its quality or deliveries. Uh, and then I, I believe that it, it, uh, the possibilities are unlimited. However, the most important is to take the point of departure, which is the uh, current, the re good reflection of what we have at stock today. Uh, this is, for example, what uh, we are missing in the whole process which follows now with the implementation of the EU Green Deal. There was a biodiversity strategy proposed with ambitious targets. For us, I would say even very ambitious or sometimes uh, we question whether they are re realistic and feasible. Uh, we don't see where is the analysis of, the, of what we have at stake today. Uh, one, one third of European forests is managed, I believe, in a sustainable way. The confirmation for this is the high rate of certification, sometimes or very often double certification. Uh, we, forest management is long-term plant activity based of, for, on forest management plans. So we have to take all this, plus we have to take into account also the data which is collected on the national level or on the field level through national forest inventories, through forest management planning. Andrea mentioned in his introductory presentation that, for example, one of the aspects which are to be put in is the knowledge base, and he referred to FISA. I mean, at least to my knowledge, the achievement of FISA today is forest area in the Union. I would say we know what is the forest area on national level for probably 100 years now. And so uh, we have to use this because we don't need to reopen the doors sometimes which have been already opened. And then where to go, of course, there are different concepts. This is closer to nature. We have also the discussion of ProSilva. For example, we can go uh, with silvicultural practice. We can avoid harvesters uh, and then we can make skidding by horses. Of, of, of the locked raw material. But we have also to analyze and be aware what are the consequences. Do we have people willing to do this job as 50 years ago in forests? I believe not. What will be the cost per production unit? Because still we are talking about the primary product from forest management, which is, which is the, the um, timber. What will be the cost of, of, of it? So then it's impossible, you know, to take, to consider this now as a kind of island, sometimes we, people say it, the work in the silo, uh, that we are now talking about closer to nature forestry and nothing around is important. No, it's a part of the overall forest economy, which is the management of the ecosystem based on market conditions, because we, this is our reality. And then staying within these realities, we are also eager to discuss how to improve the management, where to go, also in terms of meeting the targets, the climate targets of the union. But we, 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 we have to be like standing firmly on the ground. And then that's why this is the guarantee to, to bring us to the positive uh, conclusion in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piotr. And obviously, we could continue this discussion for much longer. There have been really interesting things, like I also want to mention again, Andrea, your 50 sh shades of green, which is an interesting approach. It could replace all this closer to nature or integrated forest management, SFM, as a concept that everyone would find interesting in society. Um, but that we cannot discuss in detail anymore. I would like to close this before we do a final closing poll at the participants by giving Fanny, Tomasz, Piotr, and Julia, the chance to give me one sentence of your core Christmas New Year's wish on the EU4 strategy. Andrea and Alfonso will listen carefully, and perhaps they will tell us what Santa Claus will do for that afterwards. We have to see if they want to. I guess we start with Fanny, then Tomasz, then Piotr, then Julia. Your Christmas wish, one sentence. What are your first strategy? Um, let's say <laughs> um, properly evaluate the work needed to provide the ecosystem services and the cost, reward this work, and properly evaluate the impacts of uh, the requirements related to these ecosystem services. Thank you very much, Fanny. Thank I you. see that Santa is writing it down already. Tomas. 
Yes, uh, as I said, uh, I would wish uh, less red tape for member states and, and forest owners and more flexibility for, for them in, in forest management and to have uh, uh, the new uh, forest strategy as soon as possible. Thank you. Piotr? Thank you uh, very much. I would uh, put it in that way. Uh, the European Union is always, uh, all of us, the forest strategy is going to be hopefully for the European Union, not for the Commission or nobody liking it separately. So let's have the strategy made by all of us for the sake of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Julia? I'd say three things, one sentence. One, want, okay. uh, one review the Renewable Energy Directive to reduce biomass. Come on. A target to restore European forests, which includes both carbon and biodiversity objectives. Uh, and three, a vision of a just transition for forestry in Europe, uh, similar to what's happened in the energy sector. Thank you for your, um, for your list. Uh, we can review this in one year. Perhaps we repeat the seminar there. Andrea Alfonso, you have the last word. Do you want to comment still? Or are you happy with the wishes you heard in the discussion? Was it helpful for you also in working on the forest strategy? Just one word to say that I, I really appreciated uh, the discussion and the questions. So I'll, I'll try to respond to uh, some of them uh, in, in the chat and it was very interesting for me. So I would like just to thank you very much uh, for, for this work. Uh, this is precisely the type of work uh, that we will need in, in, the coming, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Alfonso. Yes, on my side. First of all, I would have liked to have some more time to reply to some of the questions, particularly I think Luke uh, Bass uh, was not uh, replied on his question <laughs> and I would have liked to have a chance for that. But on uh, Santa Claus uh, wishes, I, I would say that we will do our best to really uh, ensure that the forthcoming forest strategy will be comprehensive and engaging all the relevant uh, actors and stakeholders, meaning member states and, and you, the ones who are represented today here. Uh, but I think we have, uh, we have a, a challenge that is uh, to work together to demonstrate that uh, the forests are indeed delivering, to communicate to the society how they do and to improve as far as, as we can in the management of the 40-something uh, percent of the EU territory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, I think with this, I would like to close. So let's see, um, what is the outcome of the super interesting discussion? You have 20 seconds to make your choice. And then we compare it with the initial um, poll, which was exactly the same questions. So now we compare it with what was asked in the beginning. We can see, um, there's a majority, it will be inconsistent. Oh no, the, the majority see the opportunities, it's 29%. 21% um, think it might be inconsistent. 90% think it's too early to say. 17% see um, focus towards environmental issues, 2% towards economics, and 6% see um, there will not be a substantial change. Now let's try to compare it what was there before. That's before. First, 28% didn't know enough, enough about it, now only 6% ah. don't okay. know Okay, yes, so about. definitely my colleagues noted that there's a big increase. There's only very few people that say that they don't know about it anymore. So this, this has been a core objective for this webinar. And I would like to close with thanking very, very much, first of all, our panelists and speakers. This is exactly the wrong time to do some webinars and, and because everyone is super busy for agreeing on this opportunity on a very short notice. And I really acknowledge this, that was, that was great. And it was great for the participants. And I really hope that you continue with some of the conversations, perhaps bilaterally. There were some interesting points that we simply couldn't resolve here with regard to time. Thank you very much. Thank you also very much for um, the ones organizing in the back, specifically IACN colleagues, Kate, um, I want to explicitly mention, and my FA colleagues here, um, Geshe, Jose, Sarah, and others. And finally, thank you very much for all of those that are still listening. Now are people dropping out, but we had a nice attendance here for about 100 people, about 90% of the webinar.
With that, I'm just looking around. If I forgot anything important, thank you very much. And perhaps we continue this and make this a tradition. I don't sure if Luke is still there from IECN and repeat it in one year before Christmas to formulate new Christmas wishes and to see who got the most presents in the last year. Thank you very much. Have a good and nice December.